welcome, welcome to the second of all time episode of Real and Raw. And today I'm joined by Puna. Um, welcome, Puna. How are you today? I'm really good, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Um, can you tell us a bit about yourself? I know that uh, you're the founder of YesMate, which is a community care platform, and you're an embodiment coach. What else should we know about you and about your spirit and soul? Yeah, so I, I'm the founder of YesMate, which is a community care platform. And I work with lots of different organizations, brands, schools, universities. And essentially, my mission is to help people recognize that they are whole and they have that intuitive wisdom and healing within themselves. Mm. So whether that's through holding space, um, through workshops, through talks, but also through discussion spaces and, and holding space for people to connect to themselves but also to connect to other people as well and hear from other experiences and gain that peer-to-peer -peer support. So I hold spaces for a lot of people from the diaspora, different communities, for them to recognise that actually, you know, everything that we're told about ourselves as a culture, as a society, and also the cultural expectations that we have on us is a pile of, of BS. So that's why we say it, yes, mate, cut the BS. And that means really unlearning, you know, all the things that we've been taught about ourselves. Yeah. And to really get to the root of the essence of how we're feeling within inside ourselves rather than looking at what's happening around ourselves. Um, so that's a little bit of a snippet of, of, of what I do and what the mission is about. And we started as a supper club, actually, um, and the idea was really around bringing people together and really demystifying what Punjabi home cooked food is. Because again, there's this misconception that Indian people eat curry and in, in, in our in our culture, in, in in my family, we don't we don't eat curry. That's not even a word in our vocabulary. So the idea was how do we how food nourishes and heals our well-being, not just obviously our stomach and, and makes us feel good, yeah. but actually the conversations that we have with the people around our table, they bring a lot of nourishment to our mind, to our body, and also to our spirit as well. So um, it started around that idea of how food heals us on all the levels. I love that, especially because what you've said around... Um, the societal expectations being a big bunch of BS is some is what, like is one of the reasons why I started writing that that then grew into today and the expectations because I I didn't feel like myself in this world I felt like someone else decided what I should believe in what I should be doing how I should be feeling and. I got into a, a pretty deep depression episode because of that, because I wasn't able to almost like not, not necessarily figure out a, my, my own place in the world, but figure out myself. Because I feel like when we have been conditioned and imprinted by the society or our families, friends, colleagues, professors, everyone around us for so many years. It feels like, like you're growing layers and layers and layers and layers. And then when you're like when you're living, it's like we tend to live on the outskirts of the layers, on the one that's the furthest outside. And we lose the connection because like there, there's so much more complexities in between us within and where we are living. And it's then very difficult to tune in. And for me, this last year and a half represented a journey and a process of shedding those layers and mm -hmm. trying to see which ones were the ones that I put and even if I did put them, did I, are they there as a coping mechanism, as a strategy that's no longer serving me, as something that I put around me as a shield, rather than something that's going to 
empower me and reinforce me. So now I'm like looking at all of the layers, like one by one under a microscope and trying to figure out, okay, does this serve me now? Does this represent who I am and who I want to be? How does this make me feel on the inside? Does it make me feel happy? Do I feel it in my gut? Does it make me smile? Yeah, and that that completely resonated with me. And, you know, that is part of my journey as well at the beginning is everything that you've just shared like I went through a very similar kind of motion with that um you know so on paper having my dream job and you know um getting to travel the world and do all these uh, on paper these these amazing things yeah but inside I felt very unfulfilled and actually felt very lost because I was turning 30 and I started really questioning as a South Asian woman what does it mean to be successful because we have a lot of again those conditions so you know by a certain age you should be married you should be settled down you should be having an amazing wedding and um all these kind of cultural expectations but then also from a societal perspective these expectations of what success is and success equates to speed to speeding up to things moving fast to scaling up to growing large and I kind of was at a point in my career where I was like does this align to my values? Does this align to my intention? And actually, what do I want? Do I want to stay here and get the promotion? Or is it a time to take a bit of a risk and really understand and like exactly like you said, start unlayering all that conditioning and start really figuring out actually, this is not just about a a job for me or a career, but how do I want to live my life? Mm -hmm. And I was really thinking a lot about death as well. So like, when I die, what do I want people to say? What is the legacy that I'm leaving behind? Because I don't want to be remembered for working for this amazing company and having having this incredible job title. So it was at that point, I took a massive risk. And um, I I quit my job, quit my job. And I didn't have a clue of what I was going to do. I had saved up some money. And obviously, I'm saying this from a little bit of a place of a luxury as well, because I live at home. But I quit my job. And for me, it was such a visceral experience because I recognised that in order for me to figure out what that next step is, I literally have to take a pause on everything. On And that when I'm talking about a pause, that pause is actually slowing down, mm-hmm. slowing down actually my thoughts, slowing down my body, reconnecting to actually not what's happening around me, but what is happening within me. How am I feeling? What am I carrying within my body? And I was really missing like a tactile experience because my background, I studied textile design. So um, I I had this fascination, I still do, of of cloth, of this exploring, of, you know, how how cultures and like ancient traditions, how they create cloth from memory. So quite naturally, I quit my job and I um, first I went to Marrakesh and had a trip with my mum, mm-hmm. which was just like a bit of a girl's holiday because we oh, do that every year. So that was really lovely. But then I took a longer trip to Peru and that, again, without sounding too um, cringe, but it really was it was a moment of like unlayering, unshedding and and reawakening like who who I was because I think in that process of I think anyone who works for like a company you start identifying your self-worth with what you what you do and you define yourself by your job title um and I know I definitely did at points um so that that trip really shifted everything for me 360 because it made me really understand the importance and the the connection of actually my own culture so mm-hmm. it got to a point where I was craving chili I was craving like coriander I was craving like home cooked food and it started to make me question like how food has the power to actually transform people transform how we're feeling but also it has the power to connect mm-hmm. um and again, it really made me question like what does belonging mean because I was so far away from home. But I felt like in in Peru, in, in, in South America, that as a South Asian woman, as a Sikh Punjabi woman, I felt very welcome. I felt very accepted. And I was like, I actually could live here. Like, mm. you know, obviously the, the, the food, the food thing would take a little bit of getting used to. But it, it made me really question, OK, when we talk about belonging and we talk about community, what actually does that mean? So 
from that point of slowing down and as I say like wading through the kind of neggy vibes and that moment where I felt like I was crumbling it was like shedding those layers and really coming back to coming back to myself Mm. because I I don't think I could have created Yes Mate and it would be what it is if I hadn't have gone through that process because that pause um, physically, mentally, spiritually, it reinvigorated me, it re-energised me and it really made me rethink everything. And it actually, that pause gave me the capacity to, to, to just explore and just be playful and just figure out, okay, what, what do I want to do? How do I want to, how do I want to serve people? And how do I kept coming back to how do I want people to feel after they have spent some time with me? Mm. I love that, especially because I, I really relate with everything that you now described. Um, Just for me, my experience, the pause was not intentional as for you for it was like a very intentional and purposeful decision. For me, it was a knockout of life, basically. So just when the pandemic started in 2020, I had like a number of difficult life situations, like from indirect family violence. So I wasn't feeling safe in my home. I wasn't feeling safe in, with you know, with my family. We've had... Uh, borders restrictions coming in so all of my plans and I was supposed to move uh to Sydney uh like long term in July and at that point I was just telling myself like just like close your eyes bite your tongue and stick it out until Sydney and then you'll be happy then you'll be all of the positive things so I was putting all of my eggs in one basket which overnight was gone because borders closed and all of my plans went to, sh- <laughs> they just fell through. And then I was literally losing, well, I was figuratively losing uh, the ground under my feet until it started to feel literal because Zagreb really was hit by two earthquakes. And then as all of that happened, like within the span of three to four weeks, I w- my body was like enough. Like I, it literally shut down. I feel like my prefrontal cortex was turned off I was living on my survival brain and there was also some like from the from December around like Christmas and New Year's time I started questioning also my work life my career I was earning more than anyone in my family at that time even though I didn't have a university degree which was imposed on me as you need to have a good degree in order to find a good job Mm -hmm. And throughout all of my life, I keep almost unvalidating and disproving that point that it's not the paper that defines your skills. It's what you have in your brain and in your heart that moves you forward. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, anyway, so I had all of these kind of tough situations coming at me at once and it felt like like not not like a slap in the face but as a proper knockout i was like i was a vegetable for the next 6 months which in retrospect was a blessing because my life by that point was horrible i didn't take care of myself i was working 16 hour days um i was working weekends i was working holidays um and it was you know like it was hard. I was basically, and I know that I was using all of that to run away from everything that was running towards me from all of the experiences and all of the trauma from my early livelihood. And I didn't want to give my brain one second of space to be still and think because I know that everyone, everything was coming after me. Um, and then at that knockout time, I took that as an opportunity and, and I was like, okay, so now is the perfect time to start dissolving and working on all of this imprinted trauma that I continue to carry with me. Mm-hmm. Um, that part was intentional. Like, even though I didn't want it to happen, as I said, now, like it, 
in retrospect, it really was a blessing because who knows where I will end up in a year and five years time because I wouldn't stop. I wouldn't intentionally stop mm -hmm. and gave myself the time to heal and to s stand still, which is like my biggest fear <laughs> because I'm always quick paced, moving forward, chasing goals for who knows what <laughs> and because of who knows what. Um, so that moment for me was very a key defining moment in my life because it created this ripple effect of all of the good cumulative things that have started happening because I decided to invest in myself. I think that's so, so powerful and so important as well because without having that self-awareness for you to actually take a pause and for you to slow down, you're aware that, you know, in the future that could have caught up with you and you still could have been carrying that heavy load and who knows what, what, what you know, would have happened then. But you're absolutely right. And it's like we we do we do move so fast because like you said, we're we're trying to reach these goals. Like for who? Like for what and for and, and, and for why. Yeah. So that having that awareness to recognise that like you said at the beginning, is this serving me? And how is this serving me as well? And I think we're living in a time now, obviously with COVID, it's presented that opportunity for people to really slow down and to really just reevaluate their whole lives. And mm. I think if if you haven't been reevaluating, then what have you been doing so you know when people were like oh we just want it to go back to normal or, or it's like really like was that was that actually working for you mm, yeah it is a a um, almost like a separation of thoughts almost in a way that it's much easier for some people to for things to go back to where they were because mm. it's a comfort zone yeah they doing this healing journey and process that I've been on, that's exceptionally hard. <laughs> and even for someone like me, who I, I always do a lot of things exceptionally well, really fast. I mean, that's someone, someone could say that like, I'm bragging about it and that I should be happy about it. But in reality, that's the reason why I can't feel any sense of satisfaction and accomplishment because a lot of the things come easy for me and I don't have to input as much as effort as someone else. And because of that, because I'm like in the one, two, three, five percent of people who can do a lot of general things very easily, I don't feel like it's something special. Uh, I, do, I, I actually feel it as a burden and I have been thinking throughout my life um, in the in the sense of, God, I wish I was stupider because it will be easier for me because I will feel, I think that I will feel happier if I was because I will have to put in the effort and then I will be able to feel the reward. Now, because I don't put in, well, I, the, I put in like five or six or 10 times less effort. I don't feel... I deserve the reward because of the ratio of how much others put in and how much I put in. But even that within itself, like the fact that you just said, you know, you don't deserve, like where does that, where does that belief come, come from? Uh, yeah, I think it's a powerful combination of mm. um, getting, like getting, phrases from the people of authority in my young age whether it's my parents whether it's my grandparents whether it's the professors who were always um you know like kind of not not, give, not giving me feedback but just like giving adding how do you say like adding comments even when they're not necessary about how bad i did something or let's say my math teacher um, I remember a couple of times, and I just lo lost the will. When we will, when I will get called out in front of the board, I would be able to um, 
do the entire task in my head and I will just, as like as the teacher is writing it, I already have the solution in my head and he calls me to come up front and I just write the solution and I get a C instead of an A because I'm too fast. <laughs> And all of these kind of feelings have led me to diso- disassociate with myself, with my mm-hmm. intelligence, mm-hmm. with how proud I should be because mm-hmm. of the knowledge that I carry around myself. Instead, even so, speaking this now out loud, I feel shame saying that I'm intelligent and knowledgeable because throughout my life, I've been told that that's not something you say out loud. That's not something you show. And I think a lot of women have been oppressed this way to, mm. yeah, kind of lower our standards, lower our voices, because we are not allowed to seem mm. smarter than someone else of authority in the room. Mm. And, I, and exactly like you're saying, as soon as we start doing that, as soon as we start shrinking ourselves, and we start making ourselves smaller to fit into these kind of binary systems, it's never serving us, and it's never ever going to serve the people around us as well. And that's something that I recognised as well, and, you know, a, a, a different kind of experience. But I recognise that when I was working a lot, like, I would tone down, I've got quite a strong southeastern accent, so... I would sometimes tone that down going to see clients or when I'd be presenting, I would try to polish my vocabulary so I would sound a little bit more um, palatable to kind of the white audience. Um, Sometimes I wouldn't correct people if they got my name wrong. And, you know, like for a lot of marginalised communities, it's that code switching that we have to do to fit into that. And exactly like you were saying like when you start feeling that within the body you can feel that that it's all it's it's like a shrinking feeling like you feel like you're shrinking within yourself yeah but also it's like a for me my experience was like it was like a resistance that heaviness um and that for me developed into having really bad anxiety to to i only realized after that i was going through through mild depression but when we start functioning from fear and when we start listening to that, whether it's our own inner critic, when we start listening to, you know, those societal expectations and to those layers that have been conditioned onto us, mm. whereas we know deep within ourselves, like, we know we should be proud for being intelligent. We know we should be celebrating us. And that's what makes us us. That's what makes us unique when we, but we're, we're, we're told that, and it all comes back to we're told that we're not enough. Yeah. We're not enough. We're not pretty enough, especially for women. You're not pretty enough. You're not skinny enough. You're not, um, you know, whatever it is, you're not enough in some shape or form. Yeah. And the, the, the society that we're in, this capitalist society, that's what it thrives on. It thrives on separating. It thrives on isolating. And it thrives on this... Um, this fact this lack of right and especially a lot in the western world where there is that separation even when you look at say therapy or counseling where we're taught about the mind we're then taught about like the body as separate things but a lot in eastern traditions it's about a wholesomeness so what i'm training in at the moment is um somatic coaching and that is looking at a being as a whole Mm. living essence so the word um, somatics derives from the greek um, word soma and soma means like a whole living person a a a a wholesomeness and it's very similar to to sikhism like to sikhi we believe that we believe in oneness in ekta which means that there is there is no beginning there is there is no ending and that we we are whole we are actually divine beings in in human form so everything that I'm, I'm I'm working towards and I'm 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 understanding about people is that actually the antidote to this isolation, this antidote to this lack of antidote to this separation and this loneliness that we feel as individuals but also within our own communities mm. is actually is love, is compassion, is togetherness and it's actually recognizing that we are humans we are humanity 
and we are one big community yes we come from different walks of life yes we speak different languages and that's not to say that i'm bypassing kind of anybody's experiences but to recognize that we are actually all interconnected And the more alone we feel, the more isolated we become, the more disconnected we become from actually the reality and the essence, which is, you know, in in Eastern traditions, we believe the spirit, call it God, call it love, call it the supreme, the force that permeates all living things and all living beings. And we're interconnected to that. It's within us, it's it's, it's around us. Mm. So as soon as we start functioning from the lack of, we actually start isolating ourselves from that. We start disassociating from that. And we actually can feel very disconnected um, in a result within ourselves because actually trauma isn't something that we experience. It's not just the experience of what has happened. It's what has happened within our bodies at that time. Mm. Yeah. Because a lot of that, those traumatic experiences, they disconnect us. Like as Gabriel Mate, my, my hero, he says that trauma is a disconnection of the self yeah yeah i kind of i i feel that deeply or rather as as deep as i am connected to myself there's still um uh places to go um Mm -hmm. a couple of like visualizations images were brought up for me while you were saying this um so when you mentioned how we are the society makes us feel like even smaller and smaller and smaller and we are like in a tighter and tighter tighter position i had an image of like a really like like a ring box almost uh that like as small as a ring box and then like there's there's little me and like it's she's kind of floating around the body the mind the body again going up and down and Instead of, like, I think that in reality, there should be no box and that, let's say, like, like that fluid inside should be, should be, fill my entire being mm. and my entire body. Mm. But as of now, it's like, uh, well, it's much better than it was like this time a year ago because I was completely disconnected. Mm. Now I'm at the point where I'm, I've, I've, like, I've treated, <laughs> I've uh, played with my mind and came to a state of mindfulness that allows me to feel what my body is telling me and to mm-hmm. listen to what my body is telling me. And often, even now, that's anxiety, that's fear, that's panic. But as opposed as to before, I'm not dismantling it. I'm not resisting it. I'm saying to myself, this is what I feel now. And I'm happy that I feel it because at least now I know what I feel. And then I can start working like, wh- why do I feel like this? What has triggered my body's response to be this instead of calmness? Mm. And, and yeah. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, and I think also, you know, as as anyone who who is going through that process of of kind of un, unlayering and reconnecting it is always a journey it's always a process but i just also just wanted to touch upon like as as a society we are also taught that we're taught the fact that um I've lost my train of thought now. We're taught that, you know, it's if you're feeling good, like it's great to feel all the good feelings. Mm. But, you know, if we feel negative feelings, we should suppress them. And we we don't like no one ever wants to feel pain. Right. No one ever wants to feel good comfort. But 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 when we like you take, for an instance, if you're eating, um, if you're eating something and it reminds you of a friend, you listen to to a song and it reminds you of a crush that you had or you fall in love for the first time. Like it's a visceral experience. We feel so open within ourselves, mm. right? Because mm-hmm. that flow, that flow is moving around within us. We're filled with love. We're filled with kindness. We're filled with compassion. But when we feel pain, we close. Yeah, we feel tension in our body. We we can feel it in our chest when we're anxious. Our stomach tenses. So our body is always giving us signals into how we're feeling. Mm. But 
instead of allowing us to feel all the feels and feel the neggy vibes, we close, we resist that. What happens when we resist is we start creating those blockages within ourselves. So often you'll hear people saying, oh, I'm really stressed, like my back is really hurting. Or like, even for me, when I used to have panic attacks, like I remember where I used to feel that that tension and that um, resistance in my chest, in my stomach. Um, and I physically used to be, be sick. And also the idea of eating and eating in front of people, like there was so much fear and resistance because I thought I was going to be sick. I, rather than allowing me to just feel and let that flow, I would mm. try to suppress that and push it down. And what happens when we repress our emotions, when we repress our feelings, anything that we repress we will progress because it has to move somewhere. Yeah. So yeah. if we're not if we're not checking in with ourselves and allowing ourselves to feel not just the good stuff but also the neggy stuff that's where that's where the kind of the resistance the fear the smaller the smaller the smaller the smaller we start feeling because then we end up carrying that in our bodies we end up taking that to work and we allow that just to fester and we then start blanketing that we start numbing ourselves so we will maybe we've had a bad day or perhaps we've got low self esteem or whatever it may be rather than actually addressing that we will you know We'll hit, hit the Netflix and we will just binge on Squid Game, Squid, yeah. whatever it's called. Um, or we will, we think that, you know, if we have a couple of, bottle of bottles of wine, we feel better. So even, um, again, just quoting Gabriel Mata, he says, like, you know, we shouldn't be asking why, why the addiction. We should be asking why the pain. Yeah, exactly. Because we, all, uh, yeah. yeah, we we all have addictions to to different things, whether that's watching computer games, whether that's binge watching Netflix, whatever it may be. But instead of repressing and and closing ourselves off to to feeling that, even though it's painful at that time to sit with that experience, as you said, in the long term, there's more benefits than then closing off to that in that yeah. in that very very short term because even as a society like everything that we're told everything we're sold derives from fear derives from a lack of so even in the wellness industry um we're sold buy this have this and you'll feel really great and you know it's all about this external taking care of but in what we've known in 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 eastern traditions is that First of all, it's your birthright to be well. And all that healing and everything that you're searching for outside of you resides with inside of you. Mm. So we're looking outside and we're never going to truly be fulfilled. And that's what I recognise. Like, yes, I can move to another job. Yes, I could get a pay rise. But actually, what I'm doing outside, is it serving how I'm feeling within myself? And how am I actually feeling? And how do I want to feel? And it was only until then when I started recognising, actually, what I'm doing doesn't even align with my values. Mm. Like, I'm working for a corporate, I'm working for a business that's so disconnected and disaligned. So how do I start realigning? And that's, for me, what, when we talk about wellness, is that everything that we're looking for is is within us and when people ask me like oh you know like what meditation should i do or how can i start reconnecting but like, when i give people this answer they don't want to do it because it's too dis it's too discomforting and it's, it's it's uncomfortable for people but if everybody could start sitting down for five minutes that's just five minutes every single day in silence yeah that would have such a profound difference because when we start actually the, the point of, of mindfulness is to connect with the presence, to connect with the awareness of what's happening right now, not yeah. what the, 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 the um, narration that's going on in our mind or our mind wandering. And for so many people, it's easier just to stay in that or to numb ourselves rather than to actually address and look at, how am I actually feeling and what's triggered this? So yeah. I always give this an, this analogy that if you have a, um, a sink full of dishes and you haven't done the dishes for a few days, the dishes pile up. And then what happens when you start turning on the tap and you start just allowing that sink to, to overflood and to fill, fill up to the top? 
is that all the the food wastage or you know the the debris from the from the, from the plates from the it's all going to rise to the top and that that essentially for me is what meditation is because it is taking up all the things that we've suppressed all the things that we've pushed mm-hmm. down and it's raising it up to the surface and it's giving you capacity but people people want quick fixes and they want to you know download this or join this and do this and it's like if you just sat there for five minutes five days a week and then you increase that to five weeks it's a method five 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 your own experience will guide you and will teach you mm. rather than looking for external things and i've noticed a lot of people you know we're reading so many books we're joining loads of, lots of different things but that that wisdom you're searching for resides within you yeah always has done always will do yeah again like i think i think i must have started each of my sentences with i relate to this so much um but i do and yeah it's like um i feel that like a lot of us, well, me included, before this point of deciding to to start um, unraveling the layers, the expectations, the trauma that's imprinted in my body, and letting go of it, um, or rather, or growing around it, because sometimes some trauma feel is so heavy that I can't be able to dissolve it fully, like. I I don't remember at least 70% of what happened to me by the age of like 16. It's just like, it's blank. It's like one, it's that TV screen when the, um, when the TV program is off like beep, <laughs> nothing there. Um, and that's because I guess that those, those years and the events that happened um, during them, were so heavy for me then that my mind just like snuck them somewhere very, very, very deep. And at least in in this point of my life, maybe later I will feel safe enough and powerful enough to get them. But at this point, now I'm trying to deal with the 30% that I do remember, unlock myself from those experiences and move forwards but as you said like it is hard i know like for me the first really really hard period was august of this year where i had like um i heard a sentence that really struck me and it was you are not your thoughts you are the observer of your thoughts and having like reading that sentence and then doing my mindfulness practice really um, allowed me to not be judgmental and not to relive each of those experiences that came as thoughts. But now um, my next challenge was I wasn't in control. Weirdly, I felt like as when I was living them, when I was reliving my thoughts and experiences that they represented, I felt in control. I was driving the bus. But now I'm an observer. I'm someone on the bus station, just like looking buses going by. I felt lost and I didn't feel in control. And then that meant that my August was filled with so much anxiety, so much fear, so much panic. I was sensitive to every sound, to every smell, to any change. I was constantly on the edge. But I was... Trust. I was trusting enough in the process and in my own will and strength that I will. That this is just like purging period of sorts, like that water kind of rise, the bringing everything up that was stored somewhere. And I was like, <laughs> crossing my fingers, be like, be patient, trust the process. It's going to purge itself. It's like it's the the, the water will clear, and then. When that happened, like early mid September, I felt like I felt like me, or rather the closest to me that I have ever felt, because I managed in that kind of shedding process 
I managed to strip so and dissociate from so many thoughts that I was carrying with me the entire time that weren't necessarily mine or weren't necessarily right. Some of those were assumptions because of what I was made to feel earlier. And then I made myself believe that this person doesn't like me, that I'm an idiot for doing something or things like that, that just like when you sum them up, the big and the small ones, it's just like one big carrying load. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly like you said, when we start listening to those kind of limiting beliefs and again, it makes us, it makes us feel that we we are not enough and it makes us feel like this is permanent and this is going to be you for the rest of your life um i know i definitely used to feel that when when you know i was going through anxiety i used to think like is am i am i even going to be able to live a normal life and like go out and eat and like be with my friends and things and it is difficult and like you just said it is a process and when we're going through those difficulties that purging um we sometimes we actually lose we're so we're so absorbed with what's actually happening within us and what's happening to us we actually do lose sight of the reality that this is just as painful as this experience is this is temporary yeah just as we experience good things and and you know we have great experiences and loving times even that is temporary as well because life is is a constant it's always flowing it's always moving and we're always moving as a result of that yeah. so and again it's very very difficult i think when you're when you're in that and depending on what kind of depth that you're you're in it as well especially with you you're saying that you you know you felt so disassociated from from yourself and there's kind of you know the 70% of of the first sort of 16 years where you 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 can't re- recollect anything because that's obviously like a protective barrier that's come up to to protect you and shield you from that it is a process and it is difficult but also how incredible like just to hear your story frank i i'm like i've got shivers and i'm like wow like i'm talking to someone who is incredibly intelligent is aware and is feeling the feels and is riding the waves because you wouldn't actually be here doing what you're doing and we wouldn't even be having this conversation so i think sometimes we forget in that process how much we've actually moved forward Mm. and it's only until like maybe somebody else um not even affirms but somebody else sees something in us that we often maybe it it is that level of shame that we don't want to acknowledge within ourselves or you know we don't actually want to look backwards because it's it's actually too painful but i think it is important part of the process to look wow like this is where i am now yeah like you were just saying like compared to where you was in august compared to where you was in september like you are here now so what does that journey look like for the next month the next you know three months and i think it's always important within that journey that we recognize that no one is going to do the work for us Mm. yeah and also to recognize that just as we have the ability to put ourselves down and you know to listen to that inner critic and and to talk absolute rubbish about ourselves we have the same level of ability to treat ourselves with love, with kindness and with compassion that we actually treat other people with. Like we're more loving and kind to other people than we are to ourselves. So I think it's really important just to take to take that moment to savor like, wow, I've I've come a long way since since last year. And I've done like not to say in an egotistical way, but actually to take um like when we talk about accountability and accountability isn't just about like doing your finances and things, but actually to take accountability for doing that work and recognizing that, like you said, like you, you are where you are because of the work that you have put in. Mm. Like no one's done this for you. Like, yes, you had a support system. Yes. We have people around us, but recognizing the fact that we have moved we have progressed and we will continue to do so with the ups and with downs, but yeah. also with 
you know when we're and that's why it's important when we're going through those difficult times that we're talking to ourselves with kindness with compassion and you know and recognizing that this is really difficult this is a really difficult time for me right now but can i can i allow myself just to open up and bring in a little bit of kindness yeah can i speak words of of love and recognize like you know this is a difficult time but I am with myself and I'm supporting myself to, to take to take that next step, to be here tomorrow. You know, because yeah. these yeah. the things that we would the things we would say to other people, like who says that to us? So I think it's really, really important that we we start cultivating a more positive self talk, a more positive mindset into into holding ourselves accountable and to loving ourselves because for me it's like everything starts with how you feel. Like I wouldn't have left my job if I felt a certain way. I wouldn't have done so for me everything has been about feeling mm. and how am I feeling in that? Does it do I feel resistance? And I'm getting to a better stage now where if there's resistance within my body, whether it's a project, whether it's a you know, a collaboration, whatever it is, even in my personal life, if if I'm going for dinner and I'm like, I used to be the people pleaser, I used to be the person that always says yes, um, and not recognise like how I'm actually feeling. So even when I had anxiety and I knew that being in public places would trigger me, I'd still be like, Yeah, okay, I'll come. I'd go to the mill. And I'd have a panic attack. So I'd be self-sabotaging myself. So any time that there's that resistance, like checking in with how we feel within the body, is there resistance? Is there resistance in our thoughts? Is there resistance in how we're feeling? And then asking, where is this resistance coming from? What is this mm. resistance telling me? Mm. Do we align with that? Do we move forward in resistance or do we move forward in openness? Yeah. And... I think an important part of that is trusting the feeling that you feel in your body. Because I think so many of us, you know, like throughout our younger uh, years, we're told not to cry when we were crying or to be quiet when we wanted to shout or ask a question or anything. And all of these small experiences accumulated throughout the years that made us not trust our yeah. own urges when yeah. you were not allowed to go pee when you should when you needed to go to the toilet all of these things almost like um subconsciously were now resulting now are resulting in us not recognizing and then if we learn to recognize not trusting and then we need to learn to trust what we are feeling yeah. To be like, yeah, this is my body really response. This is what my body is telling me. And it's right. Like no one else knows or can ever know what's good for me. Like that's yeah. that that's yeah. not 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 a reality. Yeah. yeah. And 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 that reminded me of like I remember when I went to hand in my notice and um I was speaking to a to a friend and um we were having a meeting, um, a meeting that led to normally just going to the vending machine and getting crisps and just just talking about how we were feeling. And I and I said to her, like, I'm I'm just done with being here. And I and I, just, I I said to her like, you have no idea of how I feel when I wake up every single day, and when I go to bed. And I don't know how you feel when you wake up and when you go to bed as well. But I know deep within myself, if I carry on living like this. I'm slowly, slowly just going to shrivel who I am. I'm dimming my light by being here. And um, and you're absolutely right. Like, if when from a young age, if we're taught to kind of suppress that expression yeah. of ourselves, as we get older, then we learn, um, okay, if we're feeling like this, okay, we shouldn't we shouldn't speak up, we shouldn't do this because of, of that expectation of how people are going to receive us. But I actually think that's detrimental to, to ourselves and whether that's... Um, in in kind of any form and i think especially in this time as well like i've noticed like there's a rise of people being more creative and wanting to do things mm -hmm. but there's this level of oh imposter syndrome that comes up what are people going to think if i now start like you know i'm an investment banker but i want to start a stamp collection or whatever it is yeah. <laughs> and it's like 
we should be able to play we should be able to explore yeah. and we should be able to express ourselves regardless of kind of our age or our interests like these barriers that have been put on us like yeah we need to start taking those barriers down and start recognizing that what makes us so beautiful as humans is that we are individual we are unique and we all have our own talents and we all have our own stories to narrate and to share yeah. and if we if we're comparing ourselves to other people or we want to be like the joneses next door and we want to be these carbon copies then we're losing that sense of of ourself of what mm -hmm. actually makes us us yeah and I, as a, as a generalist, that's some it's something that I struggled a lot because I was constantly being told that I should grow up and just pick a thing mm. <laughs> that I will be doing for the rest of my life. And yeah. I always felt like a push, like a physical push, this like this this completely like all systems alarmed <laughs> feeling inside of me. Because now I'm able to say that I know that my um, power and magic lies in being skilled and knowledgeable about a plethora of things, but then being able to pick up things from each of them and connect them in unique ways that maybe someone who specialized for only one. And that's okay, of course, because like we need doctors who are 100 percent doctors or like the large majority just doctors right i i wouldn't trust myself if i were a doctor <laughs> i wouldn't trust myself <laughs> but i think like then again we also need people who are multi-hyphenate and let them express mm. all of their creative talents and yeah. it, it doesn't have to be a talent like you can completely suck at pottery and still want to pursue pottery because if, if it makes you happy if it if you feel like you're going to benefit from it. Like mm -hmm. I started it in September because I, that as other than being really loving uh, ceramics, I said to myself, this is my training of sorts to quiet down my mind and focus on the process, not mm -hmm. have any thoughts other mm -hmm. than being in the moment, like being really present, feeling the clay under my fingers and not being not be outside but be inside yeah. and then and see how i'm feeling yeah and that's that is the beauty of any creative process whether it's like anything using your hands whether it's cooking pottery sewing because that's the first thing it does it brings you to the now to the present moment of recognizing like you have to kind of pay attention to this process otherwise you're not going to be able to obviously create what you're creating but also yeah. that sense of achievement once you've finished the pottery or the cross stitch where you've made that meal um and and that i i almost feel like with instagram and with all these social media apps we end up creating and curating ourselves for others and i always are i always come back to this question of like what I, where i'm working with clients or you know i'm running workshops but or if I meet people for the first time, whether it's at networking, rather than asking like, oh, what do you do? Mm -hmm. What brings you joy? What brings you joy? Because that question opens up so much more depth to somebody than asking them what they do. Because mm -hmm. we, we, you're not defined by you work for this and your job title is this, but I really want to connect to people and understand like, what what makes you smile you know what gives you your spark like mm. how are you playful yeah and it helps you to connect with people to their value so you know if you're if you're saying that what brings you joy is 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 pottery or, or your writing then for me that that's saying to me okay you value creativity you value openness you value um your time as well so but i think in this time as well it's like when do when was the last time we created for ourselves without validation mm. and actually being okay with recognizing that it is absolutely fine that it's not perfect because we're sold this like if you do x it has and you know this yeah. this level of, of, of perfection and i was um i was having a chat with um a a student who is um studying architecture um and within the built environment and um 
she was saying to me, you know, this we we struggle with this kind of level of of imposter syndrome because you draw one line and then you rub it out so many times because it's not the perfect line and actually recognizing yeah. that it's okay to fail like it's okay to try things to explore that perhaps you know okay cool you know this isn't your thing but at least you've tried yeah and like you're exploring yourself within that process and just to keep on trying and recognizing that it's fine to fail and it's fine to explore and there's no kind of final destination or final level of of perfection because I always use baking as an analogy but let's say you've made a pie or you've made a cake and you've you know you take it out of the oven and you look at it and you're like wow it's perfect for a split second before you cut a slice and then you just kind of <laughs> you know you 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 inhale that slice so yeah it's, it's about taking that time and exactly like you said franca like that trusting of that process and you know whether it's going whether you're going through that through a journey of un, unlearning whether you're exploring through creativity whatever part in your journey you are is just to trust that process and to be open into letting that take you where it needs to take you and um i know we were speaking briefly yesterday about like you know where yes mate is going to evolve and yeah and um i was saying to you that you know for me it's i've got visions i've got ideas but also it's really important for me to be open in that and exactly coming back 360 now is trusting that process that it will guide me to to where I need it to guide because as long as it's aligned to our values it's aligned to our mission you know we started as a supper club it evolved to workshops to talks to holding space to now me training in 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 somatics and recognizing that actually it's not it's not what we actually do it's not the outcome of what that is but it's how we are within ourselves and how other people are within whatever output we we decide to share with the world and being okay to to be agile and to adapt with that i think is really 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 important so much yes uh i feel like um this is now a, a kind of my next challenge uh, that's revolving around i know what i am doing and so do others but in, I think in order for me to be, well, I am open to exploring and I, similar to you, I have a vision of what answer expectations could be like in a year or five, but I have no idea what's going to happen in between. I don't know. I don't have a roadmap. I don't, I can't tell you which other products or features or whatever it might roll out i will let the process guide me but at the same time in order for me to be okay with that to trust that i need to figure out who am i being Mm -hmm. and 14 hours um and yes it's 14 hours so that means Mm -hmm. we are (laughs) (laughs) uh that means we are close um yeah, so I need to figure out who am I being because for so long and now kind of this sentence literally almost like sums up our entire conversation around how we are told certain things, how we are imprinted certain things, how we are like viewed as in singularities of mm. labels. Um, and sometimes it's not that only we define our worth based on our output and on our work but others do and that's yes. kind of the next step so for me and possibly for many others who will listen on the podcast is that in order i think in order for me my passions my businesses to fully thrive i need to stop looking outwards and just focus on the inwards 100 yeah. percent. because yeah. a, a kind of don't i never believed in um that there's a right way to do business or to do anything like one of the, i think the first article that i wrote for answering expectations 
um, was titled, you are holding the pen wrong because I am the type of person who <laughs> was told that I'm holding the pen wrong. And my argument was, well, am I writing or am I like, is my output still okay? I am still a, um, a human being, a student that's able to write. So does it really matter that I'm holding my pen wrong? I can also write with my left hand. I'm ambidextrous. I, but I, I am also doing it wrong because I'm writing with my left hand, not with my right hand. Like all of these notions just like separate us from ourselves and make us keep listening to others because yeah. we are made to believe that those who are older than us, who have more authority uh, than us, know better. And that's... Yeah. That's BS to come yeah. right yeah. to one of your first sentences. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's like no one, no one actually knows us better than we know ourselves. But in this process of being here on earth and being, um, you know, imposed with all these expectations, these barriers and, you know, we end up losing ourselves in that. But I think you're at, a, a, and I always say this to people, is that it's at a, beautiful point to be in the journey where there's that openness and you know that that unexpectedness because you could yeah. actually evolve it to to anything and I think there is this perception of um if success is equated to scaling up and and you know things being large and things being um sped up and churning out and all of this but for me there is real intimacy, there's real beauty and there's real um, value in things actually being small and recognising the beauty in and that wholesomeness that comes in that, that you can adapt, that you can be agile, that you can evolve yeah. in the way that best serves you and serves the community. Yeah, and then, you know, like, having for me having the possibility to be small not to wish to scale to mm -hmm. a thousand employees on five continents and like 10 offices around the world means that i can keep continuing to focus on myself like mm -hmm. it's always I can, we all have the same 24 hours in the day, but it's a question of what is a priority for me. Yeah. And what you've said uh, sometime earlier is how do you want to live your life? And I say, how do, you, how do I want to design my life? Because yeah. I am the designer of my own life. Yeah. And that allows, that, that empowers me to make decisions that serve me. And at the beginning of this year, that decision was, I'm not working full time. I'm barely working part time because working on myself is a full time job. Yeah. I needed so much time yeah. to go through all of the um, experiences of therapy and then coaching. And then because I'm, I started physiotherapy, I was like really attacking myself, <laughs> attacking the problem from many different angles mm -hmm. because I knew that it's not only my mind that needs to be taken care of. Mm. It's my entire body and my entire being. So doing physiotherapy and then practicing mindfulness and now starting yoga, which helps with calming down my mind and turning, in, turning inwards, not listening outwards, being able to be still in the moment and not want to jump out of my skin. <laughs> Mm. all of that helps me so much like not only the therapy and coaching but the physical movement the physical things mm. that I do with my body and where I reconnect with my body and parts of my body when I'm able to feel myself inside yeah, yeah. Um, and that's that and that takes that takes anyone who who is investing that time is time Yep. It's time, it's energy, it's effort, it's dedication, and it's, it's, it's that, that journey of that self-development. And without you doing the work on yourself, how can you then actually serve others? So I think that is, 
that is so important and resonates with me as well because it's like how can you start serving other people and filling other people's cups when you you you're running half empty so recognizing that you have to take care of of yourself before you can start taking care of others and recognizing that it's not just about your physical self but it's about your mind it's about your spirituality and it's also about taking rest putting in those boundaries saying no and actually start to say yes mate to yourself first you heard it everyone i'm feeling you know like i'm feeling uh like a, a, a glittery fluid is running in <laughs> in my entire body now uh as we are ending the conversation um and what a better way to end it than to say yes mate that to yourself <laughs> like invest in yourself look inwards not outwards mm. and make time to make yourself a priority <laughs> absolutely thank you so much punam for uh for the conversation for being here with us today and i appreciate you being here thank you for your knowledge for your wisdom for your energy for your presence being here thank, thank you. you so much thank you franca i think for you to to actually take a moment just to pause and recognize like the journey that you're on and what you're creating and also being courageous and brave in, in, in opening up and talking about yourself and your journey. And I think that is like anyone that does that, that really touches me deeply because it's recognizing that within us all that we, we have that courage and we have that openness and it's important to share these stories. So thank you for all the work that you're doing and thank you yeah for your time and your your presence and for having me and for finally we us getting together and, and making this happen so thank you so much you're welcome <laughs> thank you okay. thank you everyone for tuning in and listening and either whether on clubhouse or later as a podcast episode um i know that even though i've just led this conversation i will be listening it uh a couple of more times until the end of the year to keep coming back to all of these brilliant points and insights that were made um thank you once again all for being here and i'll catch you next thursday bye <laughs>